economic pressure is something that is, uh, I believe, a part of our Christian responsibility. Indeed, our General Assembly has policy statements that say because we have financial resources, we're to use them uh, both to support mission and to advocate for justice in the world. In June of 2004, the Presbyterian Church, USA, became the first major religious institution in America to take a step toward divesting from companies that support the Israeli occupation of the Palestinian territories. In an overwhelming 431-62 to 62 vote at their annual General Assembly meeting, the Church approved a process called Phased Selective Divestment. First, they would research and identify corporations that were deeply involved in the occupation, then they would engage these companies in a dialogue to try to change their behavior. And finally, as a last resort, they would take a vote to divest from their stock in these companies. While the first opportunity to consider divesting from companies would not take place for another two years, the backlash against the church was immediate. After announcing the plan for phase selective divestment, the Presbyterian Church USA received a great deal of criticism. Some even described the church as anti-Semitic. The church also found critics within its own ranks. Reverend Charles Henderson is a member of the steering committee of Presbyterians concerned for Jewish and Christian relations. I think that selective uh, divestment is poorly conceived. I think it's morally inconsistent. And I think that above all, it won't work. It's ineffective because there isn't the same kind of consensus uh, in this context as there was in the South Africa case. In the case of South Africa, divestment had the support of many major universities and lots of church groups. And in the case of divestment, uh, the Presbyterian Church is one of the only denominations that has come out in favor of divestment. And also, there's not one major university that has backed this policy. So we Presbyterians are standing pretty much alone in this. Henderson also believes that the policy only addresses one side of the conflict. Those who support the divestment policy focus almost exclusively upon the injustices allegedly committed by the Israeli government against the innocent Palestinian citizens. The greatest injustice is the intentional targeting of civilians, and that's part of what the Palestinian terrorists are doing when they bomb school buses and set off high explosives in public places where they know that innocent people will be killed. There's good and evil on both sides of the line, and that's what makes it such a difficult and dangerous situation, and also suggests that a policy of divestment that appears to be aiming at the Israelis and almost forgetting about the Palestinians is not going to be an effective policy. Outside of the church, some went even further in their criticism. After hearing about the decision to begin the divestment process, Rabbi Ira Yudovin wrote, At what point does the PCUSA cease being an authentic religious entity and become an apologist for demented killers who strap explosives to their bodies and go off to murder innocent men, women, and children on school buses or in pizza parlors or who are gathered for a Passover Seder? Commentators Rabbi Mark Gelman and Monsignor Thomas Hartman, also known as the God Squad, wrote, Hating the Jewish state is no different from hating Jews. Your church has become the first church body, and indeed the first national body of any kind, that has voted to kill Israel for the crime of being a victim. Given the rather negative reaction that this decision evoked, it makes sense to look at the reasons that led the church to take this step. This program will explore why the Presbyterian Church USA began this process of phased selective divestment, what exactly the plan involves, and what the church hopes it will accomplish. We want uh, not only our mission money, but our money that is invested for pensions, our money that is invested for future mission work, to be invested in causes that are not doing great damage and violating human rights abuses. Over the years, we've divested from companies that are, uh, that are producing tobacco products. We've divested from companies that are engaged in supporting gambling.
We've divested from country companies that are engaged in uh, promoting and building weapons of mass destruction. We've divested from companies involved in human rights abuses in places like the Sudan. And now as we see those same abuses continue and uh, being carried out in Israel and Palestine, it seemed that it was very important to apply that same commitment to socially responsible investment to this area of the world. We are a people who pursue what we believe God is pursuing in the world, which is reconciliation, uh, justice, peace, and redemption. So our involvement in Israel and Palestine and indeed all of the Middle East grows out of a commitment to what we call the body of Christ, uh, which is working with Christians in other lands and under their guidance. We have heard consistently from Christians in the Middle East uh, that much of the Middle East sees U.S. foreign policy as Christian foreign policy. And so to the extent that that foreign policy ignores injustice in the region, and particularly injustice to Palestinian people, then that is understood as a Christian foreign policy. This works very much to the detriment of the churches we work with in the Middle East. Most Americans are familiar with the injustice committed against the Israeli people, suicide bombings. What is meant by injustice to the Palestinian people? Many members of the Presbyterian Church USA have traveled to the Palestinian territories. These are the experiences that they brought back. A few years ago I was there and was visiting uh, with a Palestinian family, a fairly large family. They had a, a, a number of acres or dunams as they call them uh, in which they had crops growing. They had a large olive grove. They had been visited in the night two or three times by Israeli soldiers who came in and uh, grabbed up one or more of their sons for questioning. But the thing that struck me most was, was seeing olive trees that were huge and being told that those trees were two or three thousand years old. Uh, it was astonishing to me. And, and for this family, the abuse had taken the form of the Israelis coming in and confiscating part of their land with the result that they brought in a bulldozer with a, a boom on it, hooked a chain around some of these huge trees, and then pulled them up out of the ground. That tree represents generations of Palestinian families, of their livelihood. It's more than just yanking up a tree. For three and a half years, Martham and I were serving as mission workers in a small Palestinian Christian village near the town of Janin in the northern West Bank. Most of my work is as a teacher with students from first grade through 11th grade. There were times when my students couldn't make it to school because they were stuck at home under curfew, um, or perhaps they weren't allowed to pass a checkpoint in order to get to classes that day. Um, some of my students have had bullets from Israeli tanks pass through their bedrooms. We have students who have been huddled on the floor of their school bus as warning shots from Israeli soldiers are fired around the school bus. I have been privileged to visit Israel and Palestine a number of times. There was one time when I was traveling to visit our Christian partners in, uh, in Palestine, and I went to Jerusalem during Holy Week after the um, uh, suicide attack in uh, Netanya. I wanted to go and visit our friends in Bethlehem. At the crossing the uh, roadblock between Jerusalem and Bethlehem, the Israeli soldier confronted me with his gun aimed at me and said, go back. I had at that point to be crossing on foot because cars were not allowed to go from one one side of the checkpoint to the other. So I uh, waved my hand as a sign of peace and uh, pulled out my United States passport and I said, I am a US citizen and I am going to Bethlehem to visit Christian friends. He moved the gun and it appeared that he was cocking it uh, to have it at the ready and said again very firmly and very nervously, go back now. I was frankly shaken by that experience. Upon reflection in the subsequent days, I wondered about the daily experience of Palestinians 
even when there would not have been such a horrible attack as would, was experienced the night before. Well, I've been to uh, Israel and Palestine a number of times, and uh, I have been haunted by a number of recollections. But one in particular that struck me was a visit to Gaza City. We uh, drove around and visited a number of health clinics. Um, the state of uh, health, of anemia, of depression, of um, results of not only of poverty, but I think of oppression were so obvious while we were visiting there. I have visited many parts of the world and I've seen worse poverty than I saw in Gaza, but I just don't think I've seen worse depression. I have seen their lines form at the checkpoints. I have seen them being delayed in blazing hot sunshine and have seen so many of them turn back about 10 years ago in Bethlehem in a Christian community and spending time with a family whose home had been bulldozed and seeing the utter devastation of people that literally were homeless, all of their possessions destroyed, uh, really their life uh, made so much more difficult. We have a number of stories from that time, a doctor friend of ours who was in an ambulance going to free wounded folk and the, uh, an Israeli tank shot the ambulance and it exploded and he was killed. Another friend of ours whose cousin stuck his head out of the window to get better cell phone reception and was shot through the head by an Israeli sniper. The stories like this and the danger to civilian life and the particularly arbitrary nature of that danger posed to civilian life are part of the ongoing thing that for me has raised not only the specter of the security risk to Israelis but also the deep security risk to Palestinian life as well. Mothers uh, waiting uh, with limp children in their arms to see so many men lined up on curbs sitting just waiting uh, for someone from the larger economy to have some odd job for them to do. Um, it just spoke worlds to me of humiliation and of course humiliation uh, fuels anger. Um, and leads to violence. So there's a, there was just a basic problem undergirding what seemed more like a prison camp than a city to me. The disruption of life was one experience that I experienced firsthand by that one single incident. I can understand the cause for the roadblock and, uh, and the prevention of passage on that day. But when it takes place as a matter of routine every day, I came to understand the impact of that occupation on the daily life of the Palestinians. Consider the fact that more than 600 Palestinian children and 100 Israeli children have been killed in this conflict since it started in September of 2000. 600 Palestinian children, 100 Israeli children, all victims of the violence of this conflict. The occupation is violence, violence against the bodies, against the minds, against the dignity of the occupied. We're deeply concerned that uh, certainly uh, since there have been internationally agreed upon boundaries uh, for Palestine as well as Israel, that uh, Palestinian territory has been expropriated for Israeli settlements, that much of the Palestinian territory has now been taken over by Israeli-only roads, that uh, a basic uh, separation barrier or wall is being built down pal Palestinian territory, dividing Palestinian communities from one another, that houses are often being bulldozed, uh, and that people in general are being uh, subjugated uh, in what ought to be their own land and their own nation. We are also aware of the resistance that the Palestinians have put up over these years. Some of it has gone to extremes, we realize. But the general population of the Palestinian people has been a peaceful people and they have resorted to peaceful resistance. Yet they have been helpless against the huge military occupation by the Israeli government. The interest of the Presbyterian Church USA in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is by no means new. In fact, the church has been calling for peace in the region since the creation of the Israeli state. The PCUSA has been calling for a just solution in the region since 1948. 
And that calling has been based on three consistent principles that the church has asserted year after year since then. And that has been the right of Israel to exist, the right of Palestinians to self-determination, and the inexcusability and inadmissibility of violence as a means to achieve an end. We have spoken, if not annually, at least over and over again since that time in the wake of various outbreaks of violence, the Intifadas, the, in the War of 67, 73. Uh, there have been strong statements by our General Assembly against the expansion of settlements. The 1983 General Assembly was very clear that the U.S. government ought to cut off all funding to Israel if they continued to expand the settlements. Uh, Obviously, that did not happen in the either case. The settlements continued to expand. The U.S. has continued to give huge amounts of money to Israel. A session in the Presbytery of St. Augustine has been concerned about these issues for a long time and aware that in spite of all of our advocacy in Washington, uh, very little has happened to change the situation, uh, said it's time to do something more concrete. Dr. Glenn Dixon, the pastor of Westminster Presbyterian Church in Gainesville, Florida, proposed to the Presbyterian Church USA the option of divestment as a strategy to help end the conflict. Back in the 70s, I was involved in the struggle to divest from companies doing business in South Africa. It seemed to me, therefore, that divestment was a likely step that we could take that might help end the occupation. It's a peaceful step. It's a nonviolent step. In August 2004, the General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church USA deliberated and passed a resolution supporting divestment. However, this resolution does not call for immediate blanket divestment from all corporations that do business in Israel and the Palestinian territories. Once the General Assembly um, passed the resolution, the Mission Responsibility Through Investment Committee began a process of establishing criteria by which we would engage companies and then identifying those companies. Uh, MRTI met in November of 2004 to decide on criteria the cri for this process and the criteria fall into four broad categories. Corporations involved in or facilitating violence against civilians, the occupation, settlements, or the separation barrier. After months of study, MRTI met again in August of 2005 and named five companies based on those criteria. We will begin a process of dialogue with the companies shareholder resolutions, and then finally, as a last resort, an action before our General Assembly in 2006 for divestment. The last resort in this process would be divestment, and that would only happen if the Mission Responsibility Through Investment Committee felt that they were at a dead end, that there'd been no change, that the, the concerns were still there, and they would have to then come to the General Assembly and ask the Assembly itself to enact a, a, a resolution that uh, urged the Foundation and Board of Pensions uh, to divest of the stock of a particular company. We do not invest in those things that we believe are contributing to oppression and violence in communities. Um, it is our hope that by engaging these companies in corporate um, dialogue and, and consideration of their policies that we will be able to influence change without having to divest. Economic pressure is something that is, uh, I believe, a part of our Christian responsibility. Indeed, our General Assembly has policy statements that say because we have financial resources, we're to use them uh, both to support mission and to advocate for justice in the world. If divestment must take place, then uh, it will be a message to the world that we are trying to follow the moral imperative of our own religious convictions, not to participate in, uh, in actions from which we would profit, which actions would be causing the suffering of other people, innocent people. In August 2005, the Presbyterian Church USA identified five companies with whom they would engage in this process. Caterpillar, 
which is uh, obviously building bulldozers that are being used to destroy uh, Palestinian homes, to build a separation barrier, uh, to ta take down olive trees, to really disrupt the fabric of uh, Palestinian society. It is not Caterpillar's intent, perhaps, to sell those bulldozers specifically for that purpose, but they do sell them, and they are being used that way, and so it is our hope that we can have a conversation with Caterpillar They've also identified two communication companies, uh, ITT Industries and uh, Motorola, whose products are being used by the uh, Israeli military to uh, strengthen their control and occupation of Palestinian territory. The other thing that's con of concern there is that under the, the, some of the agreements that have been made uh, between the Israelis and Palestinians earlier, it was agreed that uh, licensing of cell phone providers in the occupied territories would have to be approved by the Palestinian Authority. What apparently has happened is that uh, there are cell phone towers which have been put up in some of the illegal settlements and therefore they are producing cell phone service that's not been licensed and makes it impossible for Palestinian entrepreneurs uh, to try to set up a system of their own. They've identified Citibank as a group to look into uh, where funds might be uh, being received and channeled uh, to Islamic uh, charities that are reaching suicide bombers. Uh, this is a bank group that, with which the Presbyterian Church has had a very good working relationship in the past. We've advocated with Citigroup over lending practices and other things and have had it, found it very successful. And it's been alleged that some of those banks were places where families of suicide bombers could go and pick up money in recompense for their lost loved one. Uh, the fifth company, it's uh, United Technologies, which produces the helicopters which are often used by the Israelis when they uh, go into a place like Gaza or other parts uh, in the West Bank where suspected terrorists are and fire rockets into buildings to try to, to kill them. As discussed in the beginning of this program, the Church's plan for phased selective divestment received a great deal of criticism. How do they respond to the claims made by their critics? Some have seen this as uh, anti-Israeli. Uh, some have seen this as unbalanced. Uh, some have seen this as undermining our historic, uh, very positive relations with the Jewish community. I think simply say to all of those that uh, we have tried and I think successfully carried out an effort that is concerned about injustice and human rights violations, whether they're Israelis or Palestinians, a fair, a, a fair approach that is concerned for the well-being of both communities, but a deep commitment that this reliance on occupation and violence is not the way to lasting peace. And we do that with the utmost respect for the well-being of Jewish colleagues, of Muslim colleagues, of Christian colleagues, of all people of faith and even people of no faith in the region. Uh, the fact is that the General Assembly has made very strong statements uh, abhorring anti-Semitism. Uh, they go back to the days of the Holocaust. More recently, groups like the Christian Identity Movement, which is strongly anti-Semitic, have been condemned by our General Assembly. When uh, synagogues and temples were being defaced a couple of years ago, uh, our stated clerk was one of the first to step up and condemn those. We have a concern about uh, other fellow Christians who really do not understand the profound dimensions of the impact of the occupation on the other children of Abraham. They seem to subscribe to some interpretations of Christian theology that confuses the political entity that is the state and the government of Israel with the fulfillment of biblical promises and the understanding of God's covenant with Israel. We've also been attacked for why should we single out Israel? Why not Saudi Arabia, for example, which does not provide for freedom of religion? A good question. My response is, why not Israel? Why not Israel for another reason? Each year, we give at least three and a half million dollars in aid to Israel. It is our aid to Israel that allows the occupation and the oppression of the Palestinians to continue.
As a taxpayer, it really bothers me that my tax dollars are being used in this way. Not all responses to the Presbyterian Church USA's decision have been negative. The church has received a lot of support for its stand. Liat Weingart, an American and Israeli dual citizen and co-director of the organization Jewish Voice for Peace, said, quote, We would not be having this conversation if the administration and Congress had been doing their job and demanding that Israel abide by basic human rights standards. Instead, it has been left to people of conscience of all faiths to use economic power to pressure Israel to do the right thing. Inspired by the Presbyterian Church USA, a number of other religious groups are starting to take action. I think there are several things that are happening. One is that Christians are beginning to talk with one another about where we are um, and what our different approaches are in addressing our concerns um, in the Middle East. We have historically had resolutions and statements that have been made by our denominations and by the ecumenical bodies in which we belong. We're now beginning to say, what is the next step? Um, the United Church of Christ this past summer took an action very similar to ours to move toward um, divestment. The World Council of Churches Central Committee meeting in February um, encouraged all of its member churches to, to take very seriously how our monies are invested in ways that support peace in the region and not violence. The Episcopal Church USA I know is currently considering um, an action moving toward divestment and um, there are several conferences and other smaller ecumenical bodies that are also beginning to explore how they move forward. Of course, phased selective divestment is only a means to an end. In the long run, what does the Presbyterian Church USA hope to see happen in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? What type of solution do they envision? Peace USA policy uh, for a number of years has supported what is called the two-state solution. Um, in which uh, the state of Israel would live peacefully and safely within the borders uh, established in 1948, and that the Palestinians would live within the remainder of that region uh, with their own state. We have from its very founding supported the right of the state of Israel to exist in secure and peaceful boundaries. But we also support the state of Palestine that is able to exist without occupation and without oppression. I don't think there would be anyone who would justify the violence that is occurring in the region that involves civilians and children and women and, 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 and innocent persons. Um, however, I think where we differ and where the Presbyterian Church is really clear is that we cannot be silent about what we see as human rights abuses, that we must be as clear and as strong about speaking against uh, or speaking for and into the occupation as we are and as we have historically been for Israel's right to exist.